So welcome to this evening's talk, uh, Less is More, The Art of Minimalism in Photography. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's, uh, it's a lot more complicated than the actual images that we're going to, I'm going to show you. The art really of uh, keeping your images super simple. So with just a single strong subject and almost zero clutter. So just very simple lines. So there's no, no distraction, no clutter, no, no, no mess. That's the idea. Very, very simple, clean lines. So um, what actually constitutes minimalism, of course, is a little bit uh, varied. And um, uh, it's, I've given it a fairly generous uh, definition this evening. So some of the images in here are, are probably not quite minimalist in the, in the real purest sense. And I'll sort of talk about those when we come to them and, and leave you to make up your own mind about which images really fit into the minimalist uh, category and which ones perhaps are a little bit borderline. But obviously, if we start with something something like this, is actually well, if it's photographing from an airplane, it's and you're above the clouds. You're kind of almost guaranteed to actually have a fairly minimalist view. Um, so this kind of shot, of course, depends on you being lucky enough to get exactly the right seat in the aircraft. Looking through a window that's not massively scratched, so so, so scratched that you can't actually really see the um, subject very very well. So this is obviously this is the kind of thing that I would think of as being minimal minimalist. So minimalist photography really can uh, be uh, can stretch can stretch across all sorts of genres of photography, architecture, travel, landscape, wildlife, and in, in, into fine art photography as well, and still life. So there's all sorts of areas of photography where, where minimalist photography is possible. I'm, I'm hoping to show you some of that this evening. As most of you will probably know, a lot of my photography is about water. So most of the images this evening will photograph water because especially most of my Photography that does fit into the minimalism class is does involve water, so it's it's even more so than normal. Uh, but I'm going to start off with a, a collection of a few other images initially, just to give you a taste of of, sort of some of the uh, areas and types of uh, minimalist photography that you might be able to uh, encounter. So let's start out with a bit of architecture. Move on, there we go. Start with a little bit of architecture and, and some modern architecture. This minimalist photography is often best, or easy, most easily done with modern architectures of very simple building outlines, just just straight lines. Really, in this one, this with the camera tilted as well, so the vertical walls really are not vertical, but sloping all sorts of nice, interesting diagonals. And really, in this picture, of course, just the just the shapes are very much the subject of the picture, and uh, there is no, no clutter, no. No mess. Everything is quite clear. What you, what's, may, may, the subject matter may not be that clear, but it's very clear what the subject is. You might say in terms of the shapes and so on. You might not necessarily guess that it's a building, but you can really see sort of the pattern that is created in this photo. But before you start saying, "Oh, well, it's Hicks with his diagonals again," not everything I shoot is on a diagonal. Most of it, perhaps, but not everything. So sometimes something straight, vertical, and horizontal lines works really well. Uh, with this uh, actually not modern architecture, but fairly traditional architecture in in the south of Italy, just very really straight on to the to the side of a building, uh, with the window and the sky above. It's very simple, very um, neat, and very little sort of co complicating detail. Some people might might say that having the sky at the top there is a little bit of a complication, a little bit of a distraction from the from the window. But it, it also, in some senses, helps set the context for the kind of building it is and the kind of location as well, in, in my mind, anyway. Um, so that's sort of two very contrasting types of, sort of architectural photography. Then we come up to something which might be quite fit as travel or still life, I don't know, simple knot in a, in a boat's mooring line. So we're coming in very close to uh, we're coming very close to, the, to a main subject. So the subject is actually quite large in the, in the frame. Which is perhaps a little unusual with minimalist photography. With very often in, in min, minimalism, the subject itself is also actually quite small and surrounded by a sort of a mass of emptiness, if you like. But, some, but there's no reason why that has to be so. It can be quite a large subject as well, as in this shot. The background here is is water that is massively out of focus, so everything is really just concentrated simply on that knot. Just a very simple pattern, I suppose you might say. Just a very simple subject. Uh, with no clutter and no no distractions in, in the frame. But um, we can move away from that into something much more, much wider, a very wide angle view, uh, landscape or travel photography. 
being on the road, literally on the road, bit of, bit of travel. Really, it, with the last shot was close up and with small depth of field, with background completely blurred. This one is wide angle and with a huge depth of field. Everything's sharp all the way from the from just in front of the camera all, all the way through to the horizon. So really, just a, a very big depth of field. But despite that, very little clutter, very little um, background interference. And the subject, of course, really is simply um, at, the, at, at least the road and possibly just the yellow line going down the middle uh, from the foreground through to the, to the background there. So your, your whole concentration, I hope, is really directed onto that yellow line and then directed along the scene into the landscape in the distance in a very minimalist way with little uh, little uh, conflict and distraction there from anything else in the, in the frame. Also in landscape photography, again, with telephoto work, tele telephoto lens lenses, homing in close on something like this, but with the landscape elements still actually pretty distant. So obviously the telephoto lens helps us really magnify the apparent size of the rainbow, um, but the church there in the, in the distance is still very much in the distance. But your eye sort of latches onto the church as well as the rainbow. The church is sh sharp, so that helps attract your attention. The rainbow is, of course, pretty blurred so uh, it's not so um does i think doesn't grab your attention quite so much as the church does uh, despite the fact that it's so strongly colored you might disagree i don't know um this shot taken in iceland on actually in iceland on quite a stormy day which um, well, most days in iceland can be quite stormy but this was taken actually in september a couple of years ago in iceland so it was a was a very stormy day and then wildlife it uh, it while a lot of good wildlife photography is actually quite minimalist in its approach because the background be becomes completely blurred out. Uh, obviously, against fairly strong telephoto lens, so the background is blurred, and this little hummingbird photographed in uh, Trinidad is really stands out from the background, dominates the frame. Nothing else to compete. So perhaps the, the, the stem is standing on a wee bit distracting, but um, uh, nothing too serious. Some people might might argue this picture is not quite minimalist because there's too much detail in the bird. Perhaps if the bird was in silhouette, then they might say that it's minimalist, but because there's so much detail in the bird, some, some purists might argue it's not minimalism, but I would say that it is because the background and abs a complete absence of anything else in the picture other than this, this subject. Okay, so then on a similar kind of idea, but well, actually rather different idea, telephoto lens again, but coming in really close on a uh, very different kind of animal, a domesticated animal, like an Icelandic pony, and just really concentrating just on the eye. Everything else sort of disappears from the attention. Obviously, the fur around the eye is a little bit in focus, but everything else on either side goes quickly, becomes quickly blurred. The hair on, this, on the, on the uh, pony's head is, is, uh, becomes nice. I think it actually frames the eye. It's not, it's not really distracting. It helps to sort of frame the eye and to help... Uh, set the, the mood and the atmosphere, I think. But your eye, your your attention, your eye really literally goes straight to that pony's eye because nothing else in, in the picture really takes your attention. And this is very much, again, I think it is a minimal, minimalist shot because there really is only the eye and everything else, the fur is going out of, out of focus very quickly. The hair is not too distracting from, the, from that eye. It helps us, I think, to, to frame it, in fact, as I say. Okay, so now we move on to uh, a lot of water pictures. And here we come to something that's a little bit abstract. It's taken with a telephoto lens on a day with very flat light and a grey sky. Uh, it, it's, so it's a little bit abstract, but it, uh, if I tell you what it is, it's, really, it's a, basically just reflections in the harbour in Brixham in Devon and all those zigzag lines, wavy lines are just uh, uh, yacht masts and, the, and their rigging just uh, reflected in the water and just uh, floating across the water thing. And in a very monochromatic way, a very muted color range, except for, them for this big splash of red on the mooring buoy that's over on the right. So that really, I think, just takes the attention. The only thing that's in color is the mooring buoy, plus also actually the rope that's leading away from it. Um, Perhaps that would be better if that were in monochrome, but the whole picture is actually a colour shot, but the only significant area of colour is the bit that really takes your attention as the photographic subject, and that's the mooring buoy, and, and it's and of course it's reflection. So a very calm day in, in Brixham Harbour with, uh, with uh, the yacht mass and rigging reflected in the water, plus 
this mooring buoy. I did actually um, reshoot this picture on, on a sunny day as well, just to see how make a comparison. And actually, the sunny day with everything really blue and bright and sharp and grassy was just not half as effective. This this shot taken on a grey, dull day uh, is, I, for me, much more graphic and has much a lot more impact. So it goes to show that you can do interesting photography on grey days as well. You just have to uh, select your. Or, tailor your subject matter to the weather conditions that are thrown at you. Similar kind of idea in a sense that something photographed on a, on a dull grey day uh, on very calm conditions, just about the su subject and its reflection in the water, just a lump of melting ice floating around in water. Uh, this is ice that's melted off a glacier in the south of Iceland, and this is just a, this is a very small piece of ice, but it's photographed with a telephoto lens. This is only a, Sort of a couple of feet across this piece of ice, photograph the telephoto lens from the shore. I say on a very calm day, so we've got a perfect reflection. No other comp competing elements. The shape of the of the ice itself is a little bit complicated. I I agree. It would be nice to have something a little bit simpler than this, but it but nevertheless it really I think takes your attention, and uh, obviously dominates the flame because there's nothing else in the flame to uh, to take you to, to distract you. And continuing with ice, but on a grand scale, one of the sort of compare and contrast really that close up of a very small piece of ice with a and compare that with uh, this really massive piece of ice of, a, of the end of a glacier. Uh, the previous shot taken in Iceland, this one's taken in Chile, uh, in Patagonia, and just this fabulous sort of rich blue coloured ice with sunlight um, backlighting the ice and really. Um, Lighting up the edges and, and bringing it out to bring it up, bring it up to uh, it's. Um, what am I trying to say? I'm giving it a really strong outline and brightly lit outline. That's right. It's with a bit, what, white, uh, sort of a white halo around the edges of the ice. It's quite a busy shot, I suppose. So in that sense, it's not minimalist, but it's minimalist in the sense that it is all just the one subject, or or, or just the one material, and it all four works together to form a subject, I think, as, as, as work together as, as a picture altogether. Uh, background sky is completely monotone. Mono, uh, mono, mono it's a grey. Well, it had been a very stormy day, and the stormy clouds were just clearing away. So the sun had just come out, but it hadn't been sunny long enough for, for any of this cloud to clear away. So that was great. So, yeah, quite, quite nice to have that grey behind this deep, rich blue. And something which... Uh, you, any, those of you who've been on my courses will know I'm very keen to do is uh, a lot of blurred water swishing around rocks. Uh, this is sort of a classic kind of thing, classic kind of thing for me anyway, of uh, a slow exposure, long, a long exposure of waves washing around the rocks. It gives you the move, sense of really very much this dynamic sense of movement and, and energy and swirling atmosphere. Uh, and I, I really like it also because the swirling movement of the water surrounds those rocks. And it really takes away the detail from anything else other than the rocks that, uh, or certainly the rock in the foreground, especially that takes your attention. Smaller rock in the background is kind of a secondary element, but it really holds your your your, your eye on that on that rock there without showing too much of the rest of the rock. So you just eye attention is just taken to that one area of rock that's above the water, and then everything else is just this swirling, rather ethereal expanse of grey blue. Again, um, as with the earlier, some of the earlier pictures, it's taken in very flat light under a grey sky, so we don't have any bright highlights or deep shadows anywhere. Compare that though with this with this one, which uh, is taken on the south coast of Devon, and it's taken uh, during a very sunny uh, sunset. So the sun is, as you can probably tell from the from the rock here, the sun is setting off to the right. It's very low in the sky. It's just it's, still, it's only just above the horizon still, and everything is is very strongly coloured, strong saturated colours here, both in the sky and in the water, and then a lot of detail picked out in the surface of the rock. But it's, this is very much a minimalist picture because there is only the one subject, the only one one principal element in the picture, and that's this one rock. Um, the strong colours do compete to some extent, but it actually, to me, it adds to the energy and the dynamism of the picture. We've got this strong contrast between the orange sky and the blue water, and then that strong a uh, rock standing up above the water and really giving us a sense of energy and dynamism there with its, with its rather tooth-like shape. 
Or we could move on and look at something photographed in the middle of the night. This is taken about half past one in the morning up in, uh, on, um, on uh, Holy Island in Lindisfarne, Northumberland, uh, of the moons setting towards the western sky, just to get set against these uh, these beautiful posts, oh, rotting posts in the, in, in, the, in the shallows just next to the castle, if anybody knows uh, Holy Island. And just this really simple, simple structure, very simple outline. Uh, with the moon behind. I suppose the, 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 the distant land adds a little bit of distant detail, which perhaps is a sort of a slightly distracting secondary element. But to me, the sort of the, the posts really dominate the scene, helps with some lighting from the, uh, from the moon. And that gives us, to me, a really nice, uh, simple and ethereal, uh, ethereal scene. This is a being in the middle of the night, although it was in midsummer, so it didn't actually go completely dark. Nevertheless, it was pretty darn dark. So this is a, a 30 second exposure. So the water's completely blurred out. Um, 30 second exposure with F upon 16. So this is, but it's still only ISO 100. So it's a lot of light coming from the moon and sure actually so, some light in the sky as well. So we've got a um, very blurred out water, which is, and of course, because it's so dark and it, we're getting only indirect lighting apart from that bit that's coming from the moon, uh, it, it, the whole scene is very, very blue. Contrast that with the previous two pictures. Uh, they were taken with um, about two and a half seconds, uh, so taken during daylight. So much much shorter exposure times. The water is less blurred, but nevertheless uh, quite blurred and atmospheric as a result. Move on to something else taken at sunrise. Just a very simple idea. Just on the uh, off the seashore at Tidmouth in Devon. Just sunrise coming short above the horizon and just this uh, one post uh, bit silhouetted against it. Much faster shutter speed now. This is uh, eight, an eighth of a second with the lens, with the lens after close right down at f22. So it's uh, it's much uh, much shorter time, ex exposure time. And let's say just a very simple idea. The water is not as blurred as perhaps I personally would, would like it. An eighth of a second is not really enough to blur the sea. Uh, fast moving water it would, be, would be blurred reasonably well, but uh, this uh, fairly simple, very, very calm sea is not going to be that strongly blurred by an eighth of a second. But the composition, I think, I, I like it quite a lot, this, this image. And we move on to the use of fog to actually help to create minimalism. In this image, um, we've got a strong foggy background. So the, uh, the water we got here in a, in a river estuary merges with the, the sky behind. And although, as I say, it is foggy, we still have quite a lot of light. The sun is actually starting to burn through the fog. So we've got quite a lot of illumination. You can see the sh shadows coming through this, the wreck of this boat. So it's uh, quite well lit up by the sun that's off to the right somewhere. And in this instance, obviously, the subject more or less fills the frame, really completely dominates the frame, but and almost fills it. But there is absolutely nothing else in the, in the scene that really uh, takes your, sort of distracts you or takes your attention away from it. Contra con contrast this with something taken at the same location on the same day, uh, a, a wide angle scene where the subject is really quite tiny. And that's the subject, to my mind anyway, is, is the swans here, sandwiched between the sun and the sun's reflection and then enveloped by the, these promontories of land here. This is photographed on the uh, estuary of the River, River X near, near Exeter. And uh, just a very simple minimalist picture, uh, which just, uh, really epitomizes the idea of minimalism, minimalism in photography. I find it quite hard to say, actually. Uh, this is just very simple, tiny subjects, just really giving us a little bit of life to the picture and a focus for the eye to go on to as well. And then, and also, of course, the, the usual thing of a very, not usual, but a very common thing, very, very, very muted color, um, color palettes, just pretty much uh, the almost monochromatic, but not quite. Compare this one again, same location, same place, same same day. Subject not quite so small, this boat in the background here is, is to my mind the main subject. These rotting posts here in the foreground, kind of a little bit of a sec second element that takes the eye first of all, and then leads you into the frame towards the boat. Again, very minimalist, very simple. We can't see where the, where the horizon is, it's sort of the, start, the water and the sky merge together into this very misty uh, sort of overall background, totally monochromatic image, even though this is actually a colour shot.
So then we move inland somewhat to uh, waterfalls. Everybody knows that I know I love waterfalls. So I'm always a sucker to, to show pictures of waterfalls if I possibly can. And here, uh, um, it's often tempting to photograph the whole waterfall, but for me, so the, in terms of minimalism, the uh, best way to get shots that are full of impact are to photograph just a small part of that waterfall. And this is just one very triangular part of the, the base of a waterfall in Sweden, taken uh, as I usually do with a slow shutter speed so the water blows out and you really feel the energy of this waterfall and, there's, and, it, and the veil of water hides the detail in the rock that's behind it and around it and really just makes a very simple uh, sort of atmospheric image just as of spray all around the rocks and a strong di dynamic element to it with this with it being very triangular and diagonal but all turn, everything sort of converging towards the top left and out, just outside the frame however i don't always use a slow shutter speed i do occasionally use a fast shutter speed for my waterfalls and in this instance uh, so we use a telephoto lens to actually come in quite close on the water. So in this instance, you'll you'll see all the droplets flying up in the air, and this really gives, gives you the sense of energy and, and power of the waterfall when you can see the droplets. But you've got to use a strong telephoto lens to come in close and use a very fast, very fast shutter speed. Uh, what is the shutter speed? It's, it's a thousandth of a second. Yeah, so that's kind of the minimum sort of shutter speed you've got to use to freeze the movement of a waterfall. As you can see, I'm standing at the top of the waterfall and just catching this this edge of the water as it pours over the lip of the waterfall down into the, this, the chasm that's below. Behind, every detail is lost behind, but you get some idea of what's there. This is a bit of a cliff on the other side of a gorge. But then the spray really takes out all the detail and, and helps uh, lend to the, the, the minimalist sense of keeping the background totally, uh, totally simple and uh, sort of non-distracting and helping this water that's coming over the waterfall here, making it stand out from the background and helping to keep your attention on, on that waterfall and on, on, on that water as it rushes over the over the edge. So a simple, power, hopefully powerful and uh, impactful image. Again, very, min very minimal color palettes, as with it, similarly with the, with the previous uh, waterfall picture as well. Something a little calmer, back to Britain again. And uh, this is uh, on the Somerset levels, uh, early morning, just a very calm, peaceful shot, totally minimalist. The, the, the subject really is just the line of this drainage canal as it disappears, or as it leads from the foreground and disappears over towards the horizon in, in the misty distance. Um, and then with the sun rising off to the left, got a little bit of distraction perhaps from this, this group of trees here, but in many ways I think that helps to balance it actually and, and give meaning to the to the very otherwise very flat landscape. But really just a very moody, very peaceful, very atmospheric shot and just uh, really just the whole subject really is just the line of this water on the foreground leading through to the misty back distance. Something very similar taken, uh, I think, probably on the same day in the same area, Somerset levels, a little bit busier. This may not for some people fit into the sort of definition of minimalism, but for me, I, I think it is. Again, I think the main subjects in this shot are the two swans. They sort of take you, your eye into this picture, and they obviously, I think, probably lead you down to the fact slightly busier area of, of grasses and reeds further in, and then, and then on into the rather uncertain, misty areas. Again, uh, well, the swans are the main subject, but the water leading into the frame helped to sort of direct you into the scene and, and give you this real sense of peaceful uh, early morning calm. But you, you get this kind of view quite a lot on the sunset levels because it's a very low lying, very flat and a very uh, wet sort of place. So on a day when there's not much wind, you often get these beautiful mists uh, at around about dawn, sometimes in the evening as well, but most especially at dawn. And I'm going to go back to the coast again. Now you'll be annoyed to know, but just this time on the shore, not really looking at the water per se, but but looking at the shore now. And here we have a very simple shot, perhaps a little bit touristy, certainly a travel picture, a summer holiday picture, one which sort of tells you about uh, the summer that we've just lost. It's a shot on the south coast of Devon. Someone very conveniently placed a boat there for me. Obviously, without that boat there, it would still have been a nice picture, but it wouldn't have been 
wouldn't have had that sort of uh, subject there to, 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 to catch the eye, for the eye to really latch on to. And then everything else, obviously the waves and the water are, provide some detail, you might say perhaps a little bit distracting detail, but overall the whole thing, the background, or the negative space, everything that is not the main subject is very simple and there's not really any any distraction or, or uh, you know, any distraction away from the boat that is the main the main subject. Something rather different. If this one is taken with a strong telephoto lens to home in on a particular detail, this next shot is very much the opposite. It's a wide angle, really on a very stormy day, uh, looking along the wet sands of, of the coast in Somerset, looking straight into a, a, a fiery winter sun and a, and a very stormy, stormy um, shower, uh, squally clouds as they sort of beat their way up towards me. So good. Um, again, some people might say it's not minimalist. It's quite busy in places, lots of pattern in the sand, but it's really very much about the mood and the atmosphere and, and really about the pattern as well, leading the eye towards this incredibly squally mass of cloud on a quite a, a potentially wet day. Another wide angle shot of the, of the shore, again, using ripples in the sand, ripples in wet sand, and just really lead, using them to lead the eye across the scene. Minimalist in the sense there's not much to the frame except the pattern of these ripples. And then in some ways that might make it a little bit too busy to be minimalism. And actually in some ways there's also a little bit disconcerting. I find that all these patterns are a little bit, sort of does my, do my, they do my eyes in the audience, all these ripples. And it's, it's just it's a very strong pattern that leads your eye across the frame or into, into the frame and into the view. Uh, this is taken up in Northumberland. This rock over here actually is, is Holy Island, uh, Lindisfarne. So it's just a stunning sort of, uh, landscape scene here. Uh, same location, just moving on to smoother sand and a rare instance where seaweed actually makes up a great composition, a really nice V from this kelp. Just setting, sort of giving me a really nice foreground element to be the sort of the main photographically the main subject of the frame. I'm really setting up, setting a, a nice, setting a nice subject in what is otherwise a very minimalist uh, frame and background around me, in, in the background around the picture. Um, I definitely didn't put this seaweed in place deliberately. You can see there's no footprints around it, so I haven't been anywhere near it. And also, you'll see that the seaweed is partially embedded in the sand, so it's a definitely wholly put there by nature. The retreating tide will put the seaweed there and, and, and embed it, embedded it in the sand. So you've got this nice V, very dynamic um, diagonal lines, as usual, giving us a nice bit of energy and also forming a nice foreground subject to, to, to set against this, uh, this background. One final wide angle shot, which really uh, is quite a different one, totally just uh, a huge dune on a beach, I think it's in Turkey, this one. And look again, looking along these lines of rippled sand, but windblown dry sand this time. And with the details of markings left by an animal, I think it's probably a lizard. I think the marks of a, of a tail there somewhere. So it's probably a lizard of some sort. But anyway, just the marks of, of an animal going across the, the, the sand. And it really, that's all it is in this subject. It's really very small, uh, very wide view, but with a very small subject. And, and this huge pattern as well going across the view to lead the eye into the frame. Coming in very close now instead, re really minimalist detail, just a pattern just of ripple sand, ripple in uh, ripples in wet sand. Um, coming in close and also backed it by the sun. The sun is coming in from the top of the picture here. So they've got bright highlights on the top side of each of these ripples and then deep shadows on the, on the lower side of the ripples. And that's the way that I will often photograph ripple sand because that's the way you get some really nice, strong three-dimensional effects. And that, that's what you've seen in the previous couple of pictures showing wet, wet sand with ripples. And uh, with, because there's no horizon in the shot, I don't actually have to hold the, picture in, uh, have to hold the camera any particular way. So I've deliberately tilted the camera to make sure that this pattern goes diagonally across the frame to give, them, give this pattern a real strong sense of energy and dynamism just to give it. If I'd done it going straight up or straight across the picture, it wouldn't have been anything like as effective. A diagonal really gives you the sense of dynamism and energy to, to this frame. 
another shot that's along the same idea. Again, very much close up of sand, rippled sand, rippled wet sand, uh, with backlit, again, the sun coming in from the, from the top of the frame, low in the sky, and really setting up highlights on the, air, on the sides of the ripples that are facing the sun and deep shadows in, in the areas that are away from the sun. So you really get these very strong patterns. This one rather more complicated and busier than the previous shot, but nevertheless for me, a very uh, graphic pattern, which uh, the whole pattern really makes up the, the subject of this, of this frame. And then finally, one simple minimalist shot with people. Surfers on the way to the surf across a vast expanse of wet sand. This is in North Devon. Just a very simple composition, but as it happened, um, I didn't set this up at all. This is just exactly as it was a group of a trio of, of, of people walking across the sand towards, towards the, the surf and just backlit by the sun and not just by the sun, but also by the sun bouncing off the wet sand as well. So a good, strong uh, silhouette and a bit of reflection in the, in the wet sand as well. So that's very much the sort of subject of the, of the picture and everything else really just uh, uh, balances it and complements it. I guess you might say that the sun really reflecting off the sand in the background is a, is a little bit distracting. It's quite strong, but I think the, the, the composition of the, the main composition of the people is strong enough to actually hold the uh, hold itself as as the image's main subject. I've gone through that rather quickly, but not to worry. That means we have time for questions and answers if anybody wants to do that. Uh, just ending up with the usual thing, just a reminder of the books as always. Um, no new books coming at the moment, or there's a second edition of Beautiful Cornwall coming next year, probably. So, so apart from that, everything's pretty much the same for the time being. Um, so the next Zoom talk coming up on the 6th of December is going to be light in the landscape. Actually, it should be lighting the landscape, really, but light in the landscape. It's going to be especially about uh, the, the winter landscape, though not necessarily entirely. So that's what we're going to talk about, light in the landscape. I know I've talked about lights in photography before, but it's, it's going to be specifically about landscape photography. So hopefully I'll be moving things along a little bit. And the photography workshops, the next one is on the 14th of October. It's garden photography at Rosemore Garden. And then after that is wildlife on Expo the 21st. And the last workshop of this autumn is going to be on the 28th of October. It's going to be on Dartmoor, yeah, our usual Dartmoor course. And then next year, the first Workshop will be low light photography in Exmouth again on the 17th of March. It's a little bit earlier than I usually have my first workshop, but 17th of March is the date next year. And I just, um, for the next spring's workshops, I actually published them on the website this morning. So they might be visible there for you now um, for you to look at whenever you want to to see what the first half of next year's workshops will be, be about. And then, uh, as I mentioned in the newsletter last week, um, just looking at the moment at a possible photography tour in West Cornwall for no November next year, which uh, uh, hopefully will interest some of you to um, to, to come along. As I, I think it might be for five days, and we'll be looking at some of the sort of famous and some not so famous uh, landscapes, coastal scenes, and so on in in the far west of Cornwall. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and then if you have questions, that would be great. Okay, so um, there is a chat message. What does that say? Okay, Lane has asked on sh on the shots of water on the levels. Were you actually standing in the water? No, that's they were taken from uh, bridges going across. So I was standing on a road or the side of the road, um, not in the water. Water water in some of the drainage channels is quite deep. Uh, so that was uh, yeah, standing on a bridge going across the water. Okay, so um, anybody have any questions? Obviously, you turn your microphone on if you want to ask something. I'd love to hear from you. Hi, Nigel. Hi. It's David here. Um, Hi, David. Just a, a straightforward one with regards to your ice pictures. Um, yep. Do you have any advice on the white balance issue? Oh, okay. Um, well, with ice. Say, say again, sorry. Yeah. Any any particular advice on the settings for yeah? Do well, you I always, make a specific change. Yeah. No. Well. No. no. <laughs> In <a> word, <laughs> uh, I just I always just keep it on auto auto Stick white balance auto. automatic. Right. And then uh, yeah, this is a particularly 
You've raised a, an interesting point because there's a particularly thorny issue with uh, glacial ice because glacial ice is often quite blue when you see it, but then yeah. in the photographs it comes out of dull grey. And so, uh, so because the auto white balance doesn't like all this blue in the picture, you think, oh my God, it's, it's so much blue, and it automatically corrects the, the colour temperature of the picture. Uh, so I often have to put that back in, put the blue back in to uh, uh, get it to what I believe I remember was at the blueness of the ice in, in the original scene. I don't know if that helps. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. I kind of guessed that that was so, the. Yeah, the so post forward. photography processing rather than doing actually anything on site. Uh -huh. Yeah. Anyone else? It's Laurie. No, I, Hi, Laurie. I, I just uh, noticed, and I've obviously been to a number of your talks and with you at different times, but yeah. um, you never actually show any monochrome shots. Is that is that your personal preference or a policy that you have? or uh, you? It, is, it is partly a personal preference, but it's born really more out of years of professional photography because except in the arts field, it's unusual to use uh, black and white photography in professional work. That's not that's not as true as it used to be. But uh, uh, it's not something that I've sort of been called upon to to, to need in my professional work. So I tend to shoot in color and keep it in color. Um, I haven't actually been tempted generally to actually do black and white. I, if I want to mute the color balance, then I, that's what I or mute, mute the color palette. Sorry, I should say. Then that's what comes out in the photography is a muted color palette, uh, in what is still a color image, even though it may actually look almost black and white. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Just anyone a, else? Just a question on your water shots. What What is the most common grad filter you would use to achieve those blurs in the? I guess it depends on the brightness of the day, but. Uh, the blurs in in what sorry, in the water when you ah uh, ah uh, uh, yeah okay well it depends on how much light there is of course if I'm if I'm sort of blurring moving blurring moving water that's what you mean it's not not actually fog it's, it's all about just blurring the movement of water um yeah well obviously if it's sort of uh, very early or very late in the day then you're going to very easily get a very slow shutter speed it's not going to need to worry and if you're on a very dull cloudy day you'll probably get uh, a, a slow enough shutter speed. If you were doing it in the middle of the day where, where you've got quite a bit of light, particularly if it's sunny, then you will uh, need to uh, use a, an ND filter, neutral density filter, to, to cut down the amount of light getting into the camera. So uh, so, so it really depends on the conditions. If, you, say, if you're photographing in the, very, in the evening or very early in the morning, then you, you're going to the light levels will be low enough that you won't need to. Uh, to, to do, do anything special, just your automatic, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll very easily get a, a slow shutter speed. It's only in the in bright conditions where you'll need to add a neutral density filter to the to the to the um, to the camera yeah. to the lens to actually get a slow enough shutter speed. So if you were if you'd not got any um, grad filters and you wanted to experiment a bit, would you go for a five stop or a ten stop to start? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, these, um, bear in mind these are not grads necessarily you're only using grads if you've got sky in the picture so we would darken the sky and, and not darken the water um if you if you <clears throat> excuse me if you're just photographing the water blurring the water this is a, 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 a neutral density filter which is neutral density across the whole lens so across the whole scene yeah. so um excuse me a moment uh yeah the um you're saying about the six stop and the ten stop the ten stop especially can be rather overkill and cause just too much blur and just just sort of totally blur out the water into this, this milky, surreal, um, uh, silky expanse, which can be quite nice, can be quite effective, but it can sometimes be just too much. Sometimes you really want to be able to see the move, movement of the water swirling around your subject. Yeah, and really the the most effective filter I find for that is a variable ND filter. Uh, excuse me, I just something is. Tickling the back of my throat. Hang on a moment. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, the most useful filter I find for that is a, is a, a variable a neutral density filter, which uh, goes from plus two to plus 32, I think it is. So it has a very wide range. 
not as wait, not as wide as going to the six stop or the ten stop, but it's uh, quite a, quite effective, and right. it's very effective. And you can obviously vary the amount of um, darkening that you've got, and so vary vary the effects on the water. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> um, anybody else? Okay, so in that case, if no one wants to ask any more questions. It's been th thanks for coming along this evening, and I hope that, that um, you know, I'll, I'll hope to see you in the future next talk, either or on, on the uh, workshops either this autumn or uh, or next year, and uh, we'll see you there. And uh, yeah, so if, if no more questions, I'll, um, I'll end, end the talk. And uh, thank you very much for coming along. Hope you enjoyed it, and. Uh, See you very much again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Nigel. Thanks very much, Nigel. Very good. Thank you, Nigel. Very interesting, Bye. stimulating, great, great subject. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks.